Hello, everybody. It's Philly Cuts with another Hump Day Haul. We are up to number 87. You know, where I get together with you guys each week, Wednesday, new comic book release day. And I go over my stack of overpriced new books that I get every week from my comic book shop. Earth World, great shop, Albany, New York. Let me tell you something, man. I got a lot of issues from DC this week. I think 7 out of 10 of my issues this week were DC. Pretty big. And we're fast approaching the Rebirth event, which starts May 25th. DC will be releasing an 80-page special for only 3 bucks. Can you believe that DC is going to do that? Now, I'm hoping... I'm praying that 35 of those 80 pages are not going to be advertisements. Because, you know, DC and Marvel, they have a lot, a lot of advertisements. So, let's start with the haul, baby. I got Batman number 52. This is the last of the new 52s. Last issue, number 51, was the last we ever will see. No, I'm just kidding. But for now... The last we'll see of Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo teaming up to do Batman. I think they did like every issue of New 52 except this one. And in this one we have James Tinian, who is no stranger to Batman stories. And Riley Rosmo, along with colorist Ivan Palencian. If you don't know who they are, Raz Putin, which uh, I thought didn't have the best story because I wasn't, you know, versed in like... Russian history, but it had wonderful artwork, and it's kind of cool to see uh, Rosmo and Palencia do their take in their style on Batman in New 52 garb, so it's pretty cool. I've always enjoyed Riley Rosmo's art. Uh, he's been doing Constantine Hellblazer a lot, a lot, a lot of work with that, but I think the last issue of that came out this week as well, and Rosmo isn't doing the artwork. I guess he was pulled over to here. Uh, interesting story. This is just kind of like another one-shot, like last issue's comic was. It kind of explores Batman uh, and his diary, how to move on. So he has this diary that kind of explores his travels as a young man through various locales and also current... Return from super heavy business. If you didn't know, if you don't know what I'm talking about, about super heavy, try reading like Batman number 41 through 51, man. It was a huge 10 parter. Uh, yeah, I can't even get into it right now. You gotta check it out. And there's also a new enemy introduced named Cyprius or Crispic, something like that. Wasn't that a rice wheat cereal in the 80s? Uh, he has an ability to teleport. Kind of gives Batman a bit of trouble in this issue. It's kind of a weird looking dude there. Kind of robotic looking. Uh, but moreover, it kind of solidifies the whole Alfred as father figure to Batman, which I feel, you know, at this point has been pretty beaten to death. I think Scott Snyder has always made that abundantly clear. Um, you know of how much feelings, fatherly feelings, that Alfred has for Master Bruce. And there you go. There's a nice big advertisement for Rebirth, baby. Rebirth. 80 pages for only two ninety nine. dollars Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited. It's about time DC gives a little something back to uh, us comic book people. And there's another shot there. Of Batman, Riley Rosmo, Ivan Palencia style on the Batmobile. So pretty cool. It's always kind of cool to see different artists take on uh, on Batman, you know? It's always kind of cool. All right, James Tinian, speaking thereof, I told you he did a lot of Batman stories. And we have the final issue of Batman Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Freddie Williams doing the artwork, and I got to say his... Uh, Artwork really grew on me as this series went on. Uh, I still have a little bit of reservations about Batman being a bit too blocky, but I do love how he draws the turtles. Now, we got lots of crazy stuff going on here. The mutagen that makes the turtles the turtles is starting to wear off. It's affected Leonardo the most. 
And the Turtles are fighting against the clock. They got to get back home. They got to re up on this stuff, or else uh, they're going to be forever changed for the worse. If you read Turtles, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you don't, I don't want to spoil things. But the cool thing in here is that Shredder has anthropomorphized all the inmates at Arkham Asylum. And can you guess who that elephant is, dude? Think really hard. Yeah, it's Bane. Kind of funny, man. It kind of goes through the issue and some of the characters like what's been done to them anthropomorphically. And others, such as Mr. Freeze, do not. So just kind of funny little side stories there in that regard. Um, but also, I guess, cut to the chase, the real fun starts when Batman, in a new Intimidator suit, uh, does battle against the one and only Shredder. And this is an awesome page here. This one right here. And I don't know if you can make it out in the background, but there's even more fighting between Shredder and Batman in his special suit. The Turtles take on Ra al Ghul, uh, and they do have some trouble against him individually, but when they work as a Turtle team, they do topple Ra al Ghul. So there's my spoiler for you guys. Um, it also has been teased that Ra al Ghul may be about to backstab the Shredder. The, those two kind of teamed up in the last issue, but things started to go a little bit sour. This has been a fun, fun series. Lots of fan service. Uh, lots of, you know, just childhood dreams being realized, you know? We've all played that fantasy game, right? Like, which superhero would beat which superhero, and all of this was pretty much explored in this series. You know, the Turtles did do battle against Batman at one point. Robin did battle against the Turtles. Now we have Batman against Shredder. So it's just been a lot, a lot of fun. And uh, hopefully, hopefully this isn't the last that we're going to see Batman with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So if you didn't pick it up in single issues, the trade will be out probably in a few months. All right. Action Comics number 52, The Last Days of Superman, number 6. i got to get my cheat sheet out because there's a lot of stuff going on in here. Uh, if you didn't buy last week's issue of Batman Superman, I think it was number, what, 32, I think? You got the first look at Kenji Kong. It was blowing up on eBay. At one point, it was going for $20 day it came out. I don't know if that's cooled off or not. I'm not really into speculating, so I haven't been keeping my eyes on it. It was an issue of a comic that I buy anyway, and I just found in my research that that was going on. I wanted to relay the information to you guys, any potential speculators or scalpers out there. <laughs> scalpers. Anyway, hey, you got to do what you got to do sometimes, right? Anyway, in this issue, we have lots of stuff going on. So we have post-crisis Superman... The new Solar Flare Superman and New 52 Superman all on the same page at once. Now, not really all together, but they all are on the same page. Here we go. We got some guys doing battle with one another. Yes, that is a completely Solar Flared out Superman with post-crisis Superman. And there's a sickly New 52 Superman who's rekindled his romance with Wonder Woman looking on because he is, after all, dying. The Rodney Dangerfield of Superman, New 52 Superman, has been through so much crap in New 52 that he can no longer maintain, he can no longer recover. He uh, is, is on his way out, folks. And we're at issue number six of eight. So it'll be interesting to see how this goes. Post-Crisis Superman, playing Dad. I haven't been reading that story. I forget what that miniseries is. And that's, uh, I think, Krypton, right? Crypto? Good God. What was the name of the cat? What was the name of the super cat? I do not know. Um, I'll be honest, I haven't read last week's issue. So I am a bit behind. Um, and I can't wait to catch up, dude. So... 
There you go. Action Comics number six. I don't know if this is going to be regarded as a key issue because we have all the Supermen in one issue at once. All right. On to Catwoman number 52. And this has been a real interesting story. This is part two. Having to deal with the false face society and Catwoman Selena Kyle's pursuit of, or her pursuit, pursuit, her pursuit of the faceless mask. Now, what's really interesting in this story is that we were introduced to a character known as the White Mask. Now, if you read Catwoman, you know that Catwoman, one of her arch nemesis, is the Black Mask, ruthless figure of the underworld, Sidonis. He's an evil, ruthless dude. And in actually in the last issue, he ended up killing his father. That is how ruthless this guy is. Anyway, we're introduced to the White Mask. And it turns out that White Mask is none other than David Franco. This dude right here had a big fling with Selena Kyle when she was in her younger years. They actually, Mr. Franco and Selena Kyle actually ripped off Sedonis' father, Black Mask's father. Now, you have to read the last issue, number 51, to understand what I'm talking about. But this issue is pretty cool. We have three artists doing the artwork. Uh, our main man here is Aniko Miranda. Um, and I could kind of feel out the pages that he's doing by the layouts. Uh, it does really kind of cool stuff with the layouts that I really enjoy. Actually, I'll go right back to the first page. Kind of like a outcast kind of effect, you know, close-ups of people's face and the circles, which I really like. Um, but good stuff, good stuff. But the problem that I have with uh, DC is that sometimes they have so many artists on the books that I can't tell, you know, who does what in what place with the other two artists. Um we get more into the backstory of Mr. Franco and how he became the White Mask. Um, we also find out that the False Face Society does have some contention in the ranks. They do not all get along, so that is a bit interesting. Um, but it's nice to see Selena's past fleshed out a bit more and to know that she was deeply romantically involved with other people other than Bruce Wayne, right? I'm going to miss this series. Um, I think this was the last issue. Uh, Catwoman, unfortunately, uh, is a casualty of rebirth. Uh, she's not going to be coming over. So who knows, maybe one day in the future. But uh, I'm going to miss Catwoman. All right, Constantine, number 12. Now this entity on the front cover is Constantine's old squeeze, a demonic squeeze named Blythe. Now Blythe is teaming up with Lord Neron to take out Constantine. Uh, Constantine was in his last issue in LA dealing with a magic problem there. The magic problem in New York is growing deeper. Uh, things in NYC are just a mess. Things in L.A. are a mess. And Constantine, the anti-hero, has to figure some things out. But he has to do battle against Blythe and Lord Neron. Um, I'm liking this series, man. I like the way that Constantine is portrayed. I like that he is kind of uh, begrudgingly cast into his work. You know, he doesn't exactly enjoy it all that much. He's a bit tortured. But when the time comes, he does rise up and does battle. Uh, you do get some guest appearances in this issue by Swamp Thing, Papa Midnight. Uh, so it's a lot of fun. It's a fun series, and I'm glad that Constantine is carrying over into Rebirth. There he is, man, on his knees with his old demonic ex. Yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool. No Riley Rossmo, though. Uh, the artist is Eric Donovan. I'm not even familiar with who that is. All right, the Green Lantern Corps, number five. This is the penultimate issue. Things are winding down, 
And lots of interesting things going on in this series. Now, if you remember, there were these giant beings that kind of called to the Green Lanterns on the last city of the last planet in the lost universe that they are on. It turns out that these two entities are the Blackest Knights. Their names are Arcerus and Dismus. Arcerus and Dismus, here's what they look like, folks. These are the Blackest Knights. They have been splitting the Green Lantern Corps, basically into two factions. Uh, and the Green Lantern Corps have been torn with one another. In the previous issues, we had Kilwag and our main man, Guy Gardner, doing battle with one another. Well, it turns out that Guy Gardner and Kilwag have made up, but the Blackest Knights now have Jon Stewart under their spell. And... The core is fragmented and now has to do battle with one another. But they do know that time is running out in this universe that they are trapped in. So they are up against the clock to kind of sort things out. And it's been a really fun, really interesting series. Uh, I really like the twist that the Blackest Knights brought to this series uh, for the first half of this uh, series. I thought that they were really were the good guys. And uh, then... Oh, Colin, no, Tom Taylor, who does the Omega Man, the writing on the Omega Man, pulled a great twist. Tom Taylor is a great storyteller, folks. If you don't know, he is going to be taking over as the main writer for Batman. So I'm really, really looking forward to that. And if you haven't, if you haven't, check out Omega Men, which is almost wrapping up. I think uh, this month's issue, number 12, is going to be the last one for Omega Men. So, you know, trade weight if you have to. But I highly recommend that series. All right, and then finally for DC, we have Swamp Thing, number five. Len Wein, original writer of the Swamp Thing, along with artist uh, blah, 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 Kelly Jones. That's not an original Swamp Thing artist. Uh, but he really brings like a 70s kind of feel to the book. I just love, love the inking in this, the darkness, the shadows. Well, in this series, we have Swamp Thing, who is normally... God, I'm so bad with names. Swamp Thing, who is normally... Oh, my Lord. Alec Holland. It turns out that his friend, Matt Cable, is now playing the role of Swamp Thing. And what he's done is pretty interesting. He ends up unleashing biology all over the place and you can see great monuments like the Eiffel Tower, the Colosseum just being overtaken by vines and plants and growth, vegetation I'm not sure what's going to happen man but what I do know is is that is this issue and this whole series has a great retro feel and uh, I'm really enjoying that, I'm digging it we're getting some great classics the Spectre just great looking art, man. Just great looking art, and it's very unique. And I like the fact that this, the opening of this story is in Homa, Louisiana. Now, I gotta tell you, man, I was in Homa, Louisiana. This was pre Hurricane Katrina, and I did go on a swamp tour. I was on a trip with my old man. We went to New Orleans, and then we went out to Homa. And I gotta tell you, man, that swamp tour was a trip. Our tour guide took us out on like this long metal boat uh, and we just explored the swamp and he showed us various alligators and he would feed the alligators and what was pretty cool about that was that he just had like this long wooden pole with a metal hook on the end of it and he had like a pile of raw chicken that he would put on the end of the hook and the alligators were territorial, so he knew like which alligators were going to be in which spot. And the funny thing is that you would think that when he would feed these alligators, it would be like jaws, you know, like just something just rapidly coming out and viciously taking the chicken and ripping it apart and just going crazy and berserk. But they weren't, man. They were like docile. They would just like slowly rise out of the water and just <laughs> trap that chicken down. And the last alligator he showed us was about 
14 feet long, man. I got to tell you, that was a scary experience, seeing that gator come up to the side of the boat. Um, and just, you know, you get that feeling like, oh, my God, man, if, if I accidentally fall out of this boat, I'm, I'm done. I'm done. And, and it's just awe-inspiring to see a creature like that in its natural element and not, you know, in a zoo or behind a cage or whatever. So, all right, I just wanted to throw that out there. Homa, Homa, Louisiana, man, swamp tours. And the grasshoppers there were like this big, man. I'm not even kidding. They were like five inches long. It was unreal, man. That, that, that doesn't happen in New York. All right, Marvel. We got Darth Vader, man. We got smacked with a $5 price tag, people. Five bucks, man. I was like, what the fuck? And I'm looking, it says bonus digital edition included. But wait a minute, they always have a bonus digital edition of a comic. It turns out that you get kind of a two-for-one in this issue. Uh, you do get a side story, The Misadventures of Triple Z and BT. Now, those are the assassin droids. The dark R2-D2 and the dark C-3PO uh, of Darth Vader. They're like assassin droids. They're sadistic. They enjoy killing and maiming. Uh, and you get a little bit into their past, a little bit into their psyche. So I'm looking forward to that. Now, the regular story. You do get a little cool tidbit in here. Now, do you remember in The Empire Strikes Back and in Star or in Return of the Jedi, that huge, huge Star Destroyer. Well, it was known as the Executor, the Super Star Destroyer. Now remember, this storyline is taking place in between Star Wars New Hope and Empire Strikes Back. So it turns out that the Super Star Destroyer, yeah, it looks all messed up, right? Well, it's actually under construction. Now some Super Star Destroyer history. Uh, if you remember that famous scene in uh, Empire Strikes Back when Darth Vader was kind of uh, getting all the bounty hunters together to hunt uh, Han Solo and Luke Skywalker. That took place on that ship. And if you remember the nose dive that the, St the Super Star Destroyer took into the second Death Star near the end of Return of the Jedi. So that's the ship that we're talking about. Anyway... Darth Vader has returned from a successful mission. Uh, the whole last story arc was him dealing with plundering uh, the resources of Shu Turin. Turned out to be a successful mission, and he needed that man because after the destruction of the Death Star, and shortly thereafter, in this series, actually, actually in Star Wars, I believe. Uh, Darth Vader lost a key munitions uh, depot on a moon somewhere. And he ended up being in the doghouse with the Emperor. So the Emperor, you know, needed to see Darth Vader prove himself, uh, get back in his good graces. And with the victory in Shu Turin, that happens. Now, there's extensive dialogue between the Emperor, who looks so evil, and Darth Vader. Uh, moreover, we got another story coming back at us. Lord Tanith, the Sherlock Holmes-looking dude, the thorn in Darth Vader's side, is back. And he knows the location of Dr. Aphra, Darth Vader's one-time sidekick. Darth Vader really wants to know where she is. Now, I'm not going to spoil it for you and tell you why, but he really wants to know where she is. And these two guys have a showdown. Vader kind of threatens Lord Tanith, but Tanith is like, yo, I'm not afraid of you because uh, I know some information that you need. So you can't kill me or else you're never going to know where Dr. Aphra is. So we'll see where Darth Vader goes, man. I felt like the last story arc kind of dragged on. What I'm really surprised about is that I can't believe that this series – is already up to issue number 20. It doesn't seem like it's been almost two years. I mean, I really think that uh, they, they release, I almost feel like they're releasing the series like every three weeks, but who knows? Maybe my perception is wrong. All right, Harrow County, number 12. Now, the last story arc has been focusing on Emma's friend, Bernice, and the whole 
other witch that deals with snakes and keeping snakes and bell jars and all kinds of weird, weird stuff. Well, it's back to Emma, but I got to tell you, the whole flavor of this book has changed because Tyler Crook is not doing the artwork in this. He's doing the lettering, but we now have Hannah Christensen. Now, I know nothing of Hannah Christensen, but the watercolor look of Tyler Crook is like gone. And it's been replaced with this. And I, I don't know, man. I'm not really feeling it. It just feels like a totally different book. The whole, you know, darkness to it and and the unique look that Tyler Crook gave to this series is just gone. Uh, in its places, I don't really know, man. I, I just feel like I'm in a whole other dimension here. So the story shifts back to Emma. Uh, it shows Emma. It's actually like a side story, man. It doesn't even really pick up where we last left off with Emma. It's like a side story. She helps out a family dealing with a haunted house. Now, what's interesting is that this family knew Emma before she was outed as a witch, right? Before she was outed uh, as a witch. And it's interesting to see how that stigma of being branded a witch now affects her interactions with this family. Like, she's trying to do good by this family. She's like, you know, I'm here to help you. I want to help you. And it's almost like no matter what she says or does, the family just isn't buying it. So I'll see how it goes, man, once I really kind of immerse myself into this story and uh, get going into it and see if it really has the same effect uh, as Tyler Crook. I mean, it does have some promise. I mean, look at these scary, creepy kids coming out of the wall, people. It does look pretty creepy. Pretty, pretty creepy, but I don't know. We still get the back page cover action as well. But what a what a different look from Hannah Christensen. All right, and then finally, we have Abe Sapien, number 33, man. And Abe Sapien, his mind is running amok. His mind is vexed because he learned in the last issue, after finding audio tapes in the old home, of Trevor Broomholm, Dr. Broomholm, leader, former leader of the BPRD, Bureau of Paranormal Research and Defense. On these tapes were actually some regression therapy sessions, hypnotic sessions, hypnosis, in which Abe Sapien, uh, his spirit of Mr. Call, Landon Ever Call, uh, was brought out and actually had conversations with Broomholm. And in these conversations, it's kind of cool the way they do the uh, flashback here. That's Lander Never Call talking to Broomholm, but in reality, Lander Never Call is Abe Sapien. But it's kind of cool how they do that effect. But in these conversations, we learn a ton of stuff about Abe Sapien, about his origins, about what the secret behind the egg was that he touched, that Lander and Ever Call touched, which turned him into Abe Sapien. We learn a lot of that stuff. So I can't really wait to delve into this issue. Um, the necromancer, Gustav Strobel, is still hot on the tail of Abe Sapien. And it is setting up for a massive showdown between Strobel and Abe Sapien that starts in this issue uh, that may determine the fate of the world. I mean, that's how much is in the balance in this issue. I love Strobel's little minion here. I mean, he's actually not little, but he is a brute. He is a brute. That's him doing devastating stuff to Zinko soldiers. And Strobel really, really wants to get his hands on Abe Sapien. And what I find interesting is, is that Strobel's henchman, who I just showed you, uh, really seems to know a lot about Abe Sapien, and he knew to come to Brooklyn, to Broomholm's house, to find him. So I found that to be pretty interesting, so I hope that we find some more answers as to why that is so. Um, but I'm wondering, what effect uh, is this going to have on Abe Sapien? You know, learning all this stuff, learning that Broomholm knew so much about him, but never revealed it to him. You know, imagine the psychology, what goes on 
with that? You know, why did Broomholm keep this from Abe? Uh, maybe in the regression therapy or something, the Lander Never Coal spirit made Broomholm promise never to tell Abe Sapien this stuff. I don't know, and that's what I hope to find out. And that's what's so great about BPRD and Abe Sapien is that you always get these little drips and drips and drips and drips of story, and it just keeps you going, man. It just keeps you going. And uh, if you've been reading BPRD, you know the slow drip of information that has come out about Abe Sapien, and it finally seems now that it's coming to a head as this series closes. So I am really, really looking forward to reading this you know, more thoroughly and finding out everything that goes on. All right, dudes, that's it. That's another Hump Day Hall in the books, number 87. Let me pick out a cover of the week for you folks real quick. Oh, my God, I should have I should have done this before, but you guys know that I do a lot of stuff by the seat of my pants. I'm going with the new 52 cover, variant cover, and I guess this is what uh, kind of a play on the first Action Comics cover of the New 52 era. Uh, let me give credit to who did this cover if I can, if I can find it quick enough. Oh, my God, the clock is running. Oh, my Lord, people are going to kill me for not being prepared over and over again. Oh, <laughs> Uh, da, 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 da. New 52 variant cover, Ben Oliver. All right, dudes, let me know what you're liking, what you're disliking, and I'm out. Peace. Bye.